Hi, have you ever heard about pteridophytes? Do you know what it is? I'm gonna tell you. Pteridophytes is basically a broad term that is used to describe seedless and vascular plants. This includes ferns, with ferns, their allies, and also the horse tails. Both pteridophytes and also seed plants have megaphils. So what is megaphils? We are going to talk about megaphils and microphils in the following section. What about megaphyll evolution? So in the first step of megaphyll evolution, the main stem will branch dichotomously, meaning that the main stem will branch into two equal branches. Okay? And then overtopping will occur, which means the unequal branching of the stems. Okay, there will be a thicker main stem and also a thinner side branch. Next, planation will occur. Planation is a process where the branch will continue branching in a same plane and then followed by webbing of the side branch system and producing megaphyll okay so basically megaphyll is a leaf um, that contains many veins that branch from one single vascular supply Have you ever wondered why there are differences between microphils and megaphils? So let's have a look at their developments and evolutions. Firstly, during the microphil evolution, there is a smooth stem with vascular supply in it. And then there is a process called ination that takes place. Okay, so ination is basically an outgrowth of the stem. Okay, and then the vascular supply will grow into the ination to supply the cells, the growing cells. And lastly, we will have microphyll, which is the leaf containing the single vascular supply that is called the vein. And together with the cells, all together, we call it the microphyll. Let's go through the prominent differences between megaphylls and microphylls. Firstly, microphylls contain a single vein which is unbranched, while megaphylls contain multiple veins that branch. Next, the single vein in microphylls derives from the protostyle without having a leaf gap, while megaphylls contain leaf gaps. And lastly, microphylls occur in lycophytes and horse tails, while megaphylls can be found in angiosperms, genosperms, and the fronts of ferns. Have you guys ever imagined where do we got all the fussy fuel that we use today? for cooking and transportation and many more? The answer is we got it from the dead plant materials that decayed and undergoes process millions of years ago. During the Carboniferous period, about 300 million years ago, there are a great swamp forest that has a weather of warm and humid and it also has plants that grow very tall. Those plants would not be familiar to us. Instead, they were related to various group of plants that is less well known, like the horsetail and ferns. Today, horsetail consists of one genus, which is Equisitum, and have approximately 15 species of seedless vascular plants. Horsetails exhibit in a wet and marshy environment around the world. About 300 million years ago, the horsetails were the dominant plants and grew as large as the modern trees. The horsetails were giant back then compared to the specimen nowadays. Horsetails have a rhizome that hollow, rib area stems and can reach 1.3 meter tall. It has strobulus, branches, nodes, leaves, roots and rhizome. The genus of the horsetails, which is Equisitum, can be branched or unbranched with leaves that have megaphylls at one time, but nowadays it reduced. The shirt like slender green branches make the plant resemble a horse's tail. Many horse tails consist of strobili at the top of the stem, and the spores germinate into independent gametophyte. Equisitum spores are sensitive to humidity. When the condition is right, the spore will be ready to be ejected and will go up to 2 miles an hour. The stems are tough because of the silica in the cell wall. Due to this, early Americans use it for scouring pot and today it is still be using for abrasive powder. 
The other common plant back then was a wispen. Wispen represent the genera of Xylotum and Massifera, which are native to tropical and subtropical regions. The two Xylotum spores resemble a wisp broom because they have no leaves. But wait a second, how do they undergo photosynthesis without any leaves? The answer is, the branches undergo photosynthesis itself. Wispen can go up to 20 to 75 cm. The structure of the wispen consists of sporangium, keel, aerial stem, rhizome, and roots. The pumpkin shape of the sporangium is where the spore located and was born on the short side branches. There are around 11,000 species of fern around the world. Ferns can be found most abundant in warm, moist, and tropical regions. They also can be found in temperate regions and as far north as the Arctic Circle. They also can live in dry, rocky places while several species have adapted to aquatic life. The size of ferns also differs from tiny aquatic species, which is less than 1 cm in diameter, to modern giant tropical tree fern, which exceed 20 cm in height. Unlike lysophytes, fern has megaphils, which is also known as fronds. For example, leatherleaf ferns has broad fronds. These leatherleaf ferns are used in flower arrangement and has subdivided leaflets. For the life cycle of fern, firstly, the dominant sporophyte will produce wind blue spores by meiosis within sporangia. The sporangia are located in cluster called sori on the underside of the leaflets and are protected by a thin protective structure called indusium. When a sporangium opens, the spore will be released and the spore will disperse, land and germinate into the gametophyte. This heart-shaped gametophyte will then produce a flagellated sperm for fertilization process. This fertilization will only take place when moisture is present because the flagellated sperm must swim in a film of water from the antheridium to the egg at the archegonium. After the fertilization, the megatophyte will disappear but the resulting sporophyte zygote will begin its development inside this archegonium. As the distinctive first leaf appears, the root will develop below it and the sporophyte will become visible. And then, the sporophyte will develop a root-bearing rhizome from which the aerial fronts project. Pteridophyte is a sporophyte that is differentiated into stem, leaf and roots. The root is adventitious type. While the stem can be aerial or rhizomatous, the leaves are either small microfilms, as in the legionella, or it will be big macrophils as in ferns. And plus, pteridophytes can be classified into four classes, Psylopsida, Lycopsida, Phenopsida, and Pteropsida. So in conclusion, pteridophytes such as Fern, Whispern, Horsetail, Lycopsida, the sporophyte will be the dominant stage of the life cycle and is separate from the tiny gametophyte. Wind-blown spores are the agent of this plant. The ferns found on earth today have big megaphils and it is obvious, but for horsetails and whispers, it has reduced megaphils. Fern megaphils are called fronds and it has diverse shape and size. Most fronds have sporangia on the underside and found in the cluster of sori. Established fern can reproduce by asexually by growing the plants from the underground rhizome. And plus, the pteridophyte is very important to us because without them, we wouldn't have the fossil fuels that we use nowadays on our you have probably seen ferns growing in gardens or in someone's backyard. Ferns are a type of pteridophyte. Pteridophytes are plants that flourish in a damp, cool and shady habitat, although some species also grow in sandy soil conditions. They occupy a special place in plant evolution as they were the first terrestrial plants to possess vascular tissues and true root, stem and leaves. The leaves of a pteridophyte are large as in ferns 
or small as in the case of Selaginella. Pteridophytes are widely used as ornamental plants, soil binders and for medicinal purposes. Based on the organization of the plant body, including the nature of the leaf and location of sporangia, they are classified as Coelopsida, Lycopsida, Sphenopsida and Pteropsida. The life cycle of a pteridophyte begins when the plant body, a sporophyte, bears sporangia, which are subtended by leaf-like appendages called sporophylls. However, in some genera like Equisetum, sporophylls might form distinct and compact structures called strobili or cones. The sporangia produce spores in spore mother cells by meiosis, which germinate into gametophytes called prothallus, a small, multicellular, free-living and mainly photosynthetic gametophyte which grows only in cool, damp and shady places. The prothallus also bears the male and female sex organs, the antheridium and archegonium. The antheridium produces the male gametes called antherozoids, whereas the archegonium produces an egg. When released, antherozoids travel through water and eventually reach the mouth of the archegonium, where each one fuses with an egg to form a zygote. This zygote develops into a young embryo, which further develops into a multicellular and well-differentiated young sporophyte and ultimately into a mature sporophyte. This completes the life cycle of a pteridophyte, which is divided into the gametophytic phase and the sporophytic phase, the most dominant phase. Pteridophytes can be homosporous or heterosporous. Homosporous pteridophytes produce spores of similar kind, while heterosporous pteridophytes produce two different types of spores, large or megaspores and small or microspores. Megaspores germinate into female gametophytes, which produce eggs, while microspores germinate into male gametophytes, which produce antherozoids. The egg and antherozoid fuse to form a zygote, which develops into a young embryo which then gives rise to a sporophyte. These pteridophytes occupy an important place in the plant kingdom as they were the first plants to have true roots, stems and leaves, as well as vascular tissues.